Please be seated. On the court is now back in session. Again, the floor is given to the international co-prosecutor to continue with the closing statement. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, for the record, I'd like to just give the names and dates of testimony of those that were in the video that we just showed. So, first appearing was Neil Peel, who testified on 29 February 2016. Secondly, Him Man from 28 September 2015 and 17 September of that year. Then No Satas from 28 September 2015. It San from 7 December, excuse me, 7 September 15. And finally, Ahmed Sophia, or Mathsour, otherwise known as Mathsour, who testified 13 January 2016. So, Your Honors, it has never been the prosecution case, nor is it required for a finding of genocide, that we prove that the Khmer Rouge attempted to kill every single Cham in Cambodia. What is required is that there is an attempt to destroy a group in whole or in part as such. And I talked about the word as such, I think in French, cometal, in Khmer, I think it's doik. Uh, and what that word must mean, we say it means to destroy the group identity. That is what genocide is designed to protect, not individuals, but the group. The same controversy uh, surrounds a bit the word destroy. There are some uh, books and even in some dicta from cases where courts have said the word destroy must mean physically or biologically. Although, like in the Kerstich judgment, they say that, but then they say that deporting the women and children from Srebrenica was an attempt to destroy the group. Clearly, deporting doesn't mean killing biologically. And we talk about this in more detail in our final brief, but we submit that it absolutely cannot be reconciled with the words of the Genocide Convention that destroy only means to kill people, to destroy the DNA of the members of the group. And that can be seen if we go back to the definition and how genocide can be accomplished. One of the five acts is transferring children of the group. You transfer children, you don't kill anyone. The DNA lives on. But if you take children away from their group, teach them a different language, different customs, different religion, the group will no longer exist. If you took some small Khmer Lu group from the northeast of Cambodia, for example, took away all their children and transferred them to different parts of Phnom Penh and other parts of Cambodia, away from the northeast zone, northeast area, that group in a generation would cease to exist if they grew up not speaking their language, not knowing their customs, not knowing their religious beliefs. So you can destroy a group without killing. In this case, clearly killings took place, and killings are charged, and the killing was with the intent to destroy those Cham who refused to give up their identity. The killings were concentrated in the places where that necessary for the Cham survival, these three districts, particularly along the Mekong. They also were targeting specifically, particularly religious leaders, targeting those who refused to give up the religious practice. That, Your Honors, we submit shows beyond any reasonable doubt the genocide of the Cham occurred, the killings were done with the intent to destroy the Cham as a distinct religious and ethnic group in Cambodia. One witness who testified in this case that uh, it's a very simple Khmer villager, but we, I think he summed up 
very well the history of the DK policy and its effect at Senkoi. He was from the central zone, and he told the court that after the Khmer Rouge had taken control of the area, Cham people were merged with Khmer people. Traditional clothes, religion was abolished at the time, and they were turned into Khmer people. He went on to testify that in 1977, Things changed. Khmer people were arrested and sent to, uh, to uh, Wat Atrakon Pagoda to be killed. And he explained the reasons for these policies. He said that the CPK did not want any Cham people or other ethnicities to live in the country, but rather they only wanted to have one pure race. They killed with the intent to destroy the Cham as a distinct ethnic and religious group. So now I'm going to move on to another section and talk a little bit about the accused. The, I entitled this little section my own notes, The Gang of Three, for reasons I hope will become apparent to you uh, shortly. And I want to talk about, we've, we've discussed in each of the crimes some of the ways that the accused were connected to those particular policies. All of my colleagues are talking about enslavement, and talking about forced marriage, and talking about security centers, have talked about the role of the accused in those policies. But I want to speak for a few minutes about their role more generally. There's no question that the top of the CPK, the top position in the DK, which is an authoritarian regime, no La election, no one chose them. They came to power through, through battle, through force, and through deception, pretending that they were in a front with Sihanouk, hiding the fact that their real ideology, even their being communists until 1976. No elections. They had fake elections for a parliament headed by Nunchea. So how were decisions made in that kind of environment? Well, Q. Sampan would certainly know. And he wrote in his book, Considerations on the History of Cambodia, the following. He said, in communist states, all decisions are made inside a central leadership framework, and the implementation of those decisions must be carried out the same by each individual. The Cambodia of the Khmer Rouge had discipline. They respected and obeyed the instructions of the Central Committee of the CPK. Runners, there's no question, like in any organization, the center, the higher-ups give orders, they're carried out, they're implemented by those lower down. There has to be some measure of discretion for those lower down. Every single decision cannot be decided by the very top leaders. But that doesn't mean that Q. Sampan and Nunchea can avoid their responsibility for the policies they set and for the crimes that fit those policies and crimes that they specifically authorized. The statute of the Communist Party of Kampuchea, uh, E3214, states that in regards to the army, all three categories of the Revolutionary Army of Kampuchea, the regular army, sector, and the militias, must be under the absolute leadership monopoly of the Communist Party of Kampuchea. And if we look at E312, a decision we're all familiar with, but I'd like to show it on the screen for the audience. Um, this was a decision of the Central uh, Committee. Pol Pot and Nunchi, of course, were part of that. From the 30th of March, 1976. And the first matter that it deals with is the right to smash inside and outside the ranks. We know what that means, the right to kill inside and outside the ranks of the party. It indicates the objective is that there is a framework and absolute implementation of our revolution to strengthen our socialist democracy 
all this to strengthen our state authority. And then it says that this right to kill people in the base framework is decided by the zone committee, surrounding the center office by the central office committee, and in the independent sectors by the standing committee, and the military by the general staff. So Nunchi Akusampan can't evade responsibility for how killings were implemented by those below them when they were specifically authorized to do those killings. And those killings followed the policies set by Ankar, by the center. Philip Short testified in this court in 2013. He said it would not have been possible for zone commanders to act against or outside the vast, the broad policy consensus which had been laid down by the center. He told the Defense Council at the time, you're dealing with an army which was quite small, not an enormous force, and it was an army which was very rigidly controlled. Your Honor, the central leaders set these criminal policies in four different ways. First, through their orders and the decisions that they issued, Second, through the speeches and trainings, we've had many witnesses who talked about local cadre coming to Phnom Penh, receiving training specifically, including trainings from Kusampan and Munchea. And third, another very important way that they set this policy is by setting the example. No place set the example for the terror of the regime better than S21 did, the center zone security center, where even those closest to the center leaders, to Pol Pot, Nimshi, and Kusampan, were taken to be killed. And also in the way that the killings were carried out in Phnom Penh following the capture of the victory of 17 April, when former members, leaders of the old regime, military, and others were gathered together and killed. It again is that Khmer proper, the back foot follows the front foot. These center leaders set a clear example of the kind of ruthless, brutal policies they wanted to follow. And finally, they ensured these policies were carried out by killing anyone who advocated a less radical path, such as Hu Yuan. We've seen in telegrams the zones reporting to the center, the sectors taking instructions from the center. We've seen that zone and sector, district cadre, commune cadre, even going to Phnom Penh for trainings. We know that at the very top of this hierarchy was Paul Pot. But as Q Sampan told a radio audience in 2007, he said, Quote, Pol Pot hunted down and made arrests with the participation from the standing committee. He never did anything alone. And Q Sampan would know this because he was at those standing committee meetings, as we've seen from the surviving documents. But even more importantly, Q Sampan, along with Nunchea, they were Pol Pot's closest associates. And I want to be clear, we are not saying that they were among Pol Pot's closest associates, because the evidence shows more than that. It shows that Pol Pot's two closest associates, the center center, consisted of Pol Pot, Nunchea, and Q Sampan, this gang of three who together were the very center ensuring the policies of Pol Pot were carried out and conveying that to the zones and to others, targeting any rivals who they suspected could possibly uh, challenge their rule simply for execution. Nunche and Q Sampan remained with Paul Pot up to Paul Pot's final arrest and death. 
et la mort they de Pol Pot. Always supported his policies. Ils ont toujours soutenu They never disagreed with him during the regime. Even after the regime, they refused to condemn him. They often, both of them, spoke in high praise of Pol Pot and his policies. They were always loyal to Pol Pot. And they protected each other, Moon Jae-in protecting Q Sampan, for example. As we all know, when, an when a confession implicated Q Sampan, Moon Jae-in ordered Doik to bury him. The evidence shows that these three, this gang of three, they lived, ate, and worked together. Uh, just to remind ourselves, I'd like to show the first video. This is um, a video that was also shown during the testimony of Kipun. It's from the movie Cambodia Year Zero, E3-2346. And you see here the three of them, Pol Pot, Moon Chia, Q Sampan, studying a map. Pipun testified that this was uh, when they were planning the attack, one of the final attacks on Phnom Penh. Pipun, of course, was Pol Pot's bodyguard and messenger during that period, and he knew Pol Pot's life very well. He testified that Pol Pot would have breakfast and lunch together every day with Moon Chie and Q Sampan, and that they worked all day together. He also testified that after the 17 April the capture of Phnom Penh, he would see the three of them together, day and night, first at the train station, and then later at the Commerce Ministry when uh, they transferred there. It's not just Pipun that says this. Q Sampan, in a recorded interview, said, quote, as for daily life, Paul Pot and Nun Chia had meals with me and we had meals together. We did nothing separately. That's E3-3198. Nun Chia corroborated that. He said exactly the same thing in his interviews with Tet Sambat. In the Behind the Killing Fields book, he says that Nun Chia is quoted as saying that uh, during the DK regime, the three of them, Q Sampan, Paul Pot, and Nun Chia regularly ate their meals together. Song Sekun testified uh, in case 2-1. You recall he was a very high-level cadre from Office B1 who became the foreign ministry. And again, a person who knew Pol Pot well because he was Pol Pot's personal interpreter. And he talks in this video uh, of coming about Pol Pot's relationship with Nun Chea. We can play video two. In fact, Swan Sukun was Pol Pot's en fait, former assistant, and close enough to confirm the importance of the man we're hoping to find. Uh, is the brother number two. Nunchia is the chief of the security committee. I think you know the, the strongest man, I think, after Pol Pot. I think he was the most Pol Pot shadow. So Song Sukun describes Nun Chea as Pol Pot's shadow. But let's hear how Q Sampan. First, I want to remind you, he, he told interviewers that he respected Pol Pot and he called him a great leader in his interviews in the film Facing Genocide, E109-2.3. And then he said the following, if we can show video number three, please. When he came to Palin to work, it's here that he lives. Je le suis tout le temps comme une ombre. I follow him all the time, like a shadow. So Q Sampan confirms that he too was Paul Pot's shadow. So this double shadow supported Paul Pot throughout his time, but particularly during the DK regime. Paul Pot, a paranoid person who trusted very few, 
he trusted to et Anunciar. Il en parle de façon émotionnelle. Peut-on projeter la vidéo numéro 4 Je le vois constamment ici, au Cardamom. Je peux toujours le voir ici, dans les Cardamoms. Mais c'est l'homme, ça, j'ai son image. Toujours. J'ai toujours une image de lui dans ma tête. Do you miss Pol Pot? Do you miss him? Parce que c'est une tête rare, comme. Because he had a very rare mind for us. Nuncia, in, in, in the film uh, Behind the Killing Fields, the film he talks about how Pol Pot Nuncia came to power to become the leader of the CPK. Pol Pot, Pol Pot he actually pointed out that he was the number two next in line, although he had a little problem because his uncle, Sien Hang, had been a traitor, who actually had been uh, working with the Sihanouk regime against the CPK. So he said he suggested that Pol Pot become the leader. But Paul Pot said he would do it, but they would always work together as a team. And then Tetsambad asked Nunchea about how that did work out during the time they were in power. I'd like to play his answer to those questions. That question. Please play video 5. Did you and Pol Pot ever argue with each other or have dispute when you were in the government? There was none. Réponse, non. There was none between 75 and 79. Non, pas du tout. Entre 1975 et 1979. There was no serious problem. So throughout the DK regime, from the forced transfers of the people to the enslavement of people on work sites and cooperatives, de, de where they were starved and denied of all freedoms, to the security centers, the 190 so security centers set up around the country where people were sent and killed with no judicial process. Policies towards the Cham and Vietnamese, the genocidal policies. Confirms he had no disagreements, no serious problem with Pol Pot. And when Q Sampan was asked about Pol Pot's role in these crimes, he gave the following answer. If we could play video number six from Facing Genocide, please. Pol Pot pour faire oublier cela. They demonize Pol Pot. We must forget about this. Pol Pot, the dictator. They say Pol Pot is a dictator. And they talk about genocide. En grand dirigeant. That's not true. En dirigeant dans tel mouvement. The great leader. Ne peut pas agir comme ça. It's such a time could never act like that. If he acted like that, à créer un tel mouvement. He wouldn't have been able to create such a movement. Je vais crier ça devant le tribunal. I want to shout this out at the trial in the court. In his book, Cambodia's Recent History, Q. Sampan wrote that Pol Pot represented the historical leader who was never wrong when it came to making important decisions. Nguyen Chia, in his, in, in his uh, taped interviews in the video we saw the, the movie Behind the Killing Fields, he also talks about how he and Pol Pot would have attend self-criticism sessions together. And he's asked, well, what did you, what did Pol Pot criticize you for? What did Pol Pot criticize Nunchea for? 
quelles étaient les critiques que says, Paul Pot criticized him for being too hard line. It's really amazing to be called too hard line by Paul Pot. And he said he criticized Paul Pot for trusting too easily. Apparently, Nunchea felt Pol Pot should be even more suspicious and distrustful. These people remained loyal to each other. Nunchea and Kusampan defected to the government on exactly the same day. They defected together 25 December 1998. And we've talked about this uh, confession where Nunchea saved Kusampan by instructing Doik. And Doik came to him with a confession by Kusampan, with someone implicating Kusampan. He told Doik, don't report this again and don't say it again. I don't believe people's confession that laid blame on Kusampan. That's not Doik's testimony, although Doik said the same thing. That's from what Nunchea told Setsamba. That he saved Q Sampan, that there was a confession implicating Q Sampan, and he ordered Doik to leave, to go away, and never come back with any more confessions laying blame on Q Sampan. So these three, these double shadows of Pol Pot, they formed a gang of three that was the innermost circle of power that is responsible for the criminal policies of the DK regime. Your Honours may remember K. Pop's wife who testified in this court on the 4th of June 2015. She was asked who was her, her husband's boss. Her husband, K. Pop, of course, was the central zone leader at the end of the regime, one of the key killers in the purges. And what was her answer? She said, Pol Pot, Nunchea, and Q Sampan. Of course, both Nunchea and Q Sampan have given various stories, often contradicting themselves in preparation for how they would defend themselves and prepare and uh, attempt to evade responsibility for the crimes. And one of the ways that Nunchea particularly has excuse me, that Q Sampan particularly has relied upon is uh, his uh, claim to have been unaware of what was going on in Cambodia, in the democratic regime, unaware of the enslavements, unaware of the purges, didn't know anything about the crimes occurring. We can show video number seven, please. À votre avis, combien de gens sont morts pendant le Khmer Rouge Je ne peux pas vous dire exactement le chiffre. Certainement, il y en a beaucoup, mais je ne crois pas jusqu'à 2 millions ou ça. Mais je ne crois pas que c'était plus que 2 millions. C'est un peu exagéré. Quelle est votre responsabilité pour ce qui s'est passé Et concernant votre responsabilité pour ce qui s'est passé my personal responsibility. I, I don't have any power. Perhaps. Mais même du point de vue responsabilité. But even if you're talking about responsibility. On ne peut pas me le reprocher puisque je ne j'ignorais tout. They can't accuse me of anything because I. Pourquoi ne pas savoir? Pourquoi ne pas chercher à savoir Why didn't I know Why didn't I try to find out vous pouvez me reprocher ça. C'est une responsabilité, ça. Maybe you could criticize me for that. Mais pour moi, but for si me, je ne cherche à pas à savoir, c'est que je respecte la discipline du parti. I didn't try to find anything out because I respected the party discipline. Did you feel tricked or cheated by Pol Pot that he didn't tell you Non. Parce que no. après, quand même, because afterwards, je sens que even a, so, I feel quand même raison. Ce que vraiment that he was right, fait. even so. Voyez what Popo Popo did, don't you faire. see, he yes. had reasons for it. S21, je ne savais pas, j'ignorais complètement. S21, I didn't even know it existed. Je pourrais pas attribuer ça à Pol Pot, so I can't attribute that to Pol Pot, because I don't know anything about it. So we see that 
Your Honours, even in this short segment, Kusampan is contradicting himself, Bref, claiming first he knew nothing about what went on, he doesn't know anything about the killings, and is claiming Pol Pot had reasons for everything he did. Temps, did. Well, well, how would he know Pol Pot had reasons if he didn't know what was occurring? Of course he knew. He was the head of state.